So you're the closers. Yes. <laughs> so yes. excited. We're going to close this party down. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to close the party down. We're going to have fun doing it. Um, real quickly, how many people in the audience are therapists or coaches? Okay, wonderful. Thank you for your service. How many people see a therapist or a coach? <laughs> All right. We've got the right crowd. Um, so we titled this um, uh, Honest Conversation with My Shrink. I'm the shrink. This is my patient. <laughs> this is my patient. You should have seen Dan before they met. He was, a, he was just a piece <laughs> of work. Um, so I um, want to open it up, and the dialogue can happen just as much between the two of you than it is with me. And I think you have such a unique relationship. Very few people, first of all, get on stage with their, <laughs> their therapist. <laughs> um, very rare. And very few people have the kind of closeness that you have. You're both client and... and um, therapist. Therapist. Thank you. Uh, and you're also, you're also deep uh, friends. And so I thought I would begin by um, kind of like asking you, how do you manage that dance? Uh, do you have to say, all right, now I'm in my therapist hat now and now I'm your friend? Or have you gotten so close to one another that you can kind of like mix those worlds together? And Dan, you're looking at it with, you, with your lips. Dan yeah. wants everyone to know that he's not breaking any rules by talking publicly about our therapy. I broke that rule for him. So, <laughs> so it was yeah. my decision to talk about therapy and be uh, forthcoming about my own experience. And I wrote a book about it with Dan and used his real name. It was either that or a fictitious name. So he chose himself um, because I was giving somebody a lot of credit for helping me kind of become self-realized and become self-actualized and become all the things that I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, and I guess the face is also, just to be really clear, um, the way Chelsea and I met was um, in a professional capacity where you were interviewing me for a show. For my, old, my last talk show on Netflix, he, I was interviewing you, yeah. But and, and there were moments in that interview that were, you know, kind of funny, and I think you said you're supposed to be the funny one, which I had to take a deep breath and go, okay, because the cameras were rolling and everything like that. Plus, you weren't being funny, so I was yes. helpful. <laughs> right, that's right. You, have you worked with him on that? <laughs> yes, no, 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 okay. No, no. My, we're just finishing my project. Okay, I'll yeah. get to that okay. next. <laughs> so, so then, as you say in the book, right, um, there was a call from Brandon, from your assistant, to, you know, to come in for therapy. So... I am Chelsea's therapist. So just to be really clear, because this is a violation of ethical rules and you know, legal issues, we're not friends. I mean, we're friendly. <laughs> no, 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 you don't understand this, Chelsea. Yeah. You, you're not allowed to we're do not, therapy. We're not friends. friends. We're not so friends. it isn't like we have to work out roles, like, oh, now we're friends, now we're therapists. Got it. We're yeah, friendly right. and I deeply care about you. Yeah. And I'm your therapist. Got it. And so, and this, so that's really clear. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so, got it. And so, so how, how you, 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 you have had the experience of the two of us, and we're really friendly with each other because I deeply respect yeah. Chelsea, and she sometimes respects me. Um, <laughs> oh, look who's funny now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I am rubbing I off should. on you. <laughs> Okay, anyway, I just want to make that yeah, clear from the beginning. Yeah, we're totally crystal clear. Yeah. Crystal so he, clear. he blocked me on Instagram is what he's trying to tell you. I uh, got it. <laughs> I've even unfriended her, yeah. yeah. Um, so talk about the uh, professional relationship between the two of you and what you've learned uh, in that process. And we were talking backstage, and one of the things that you had mentioned was, Chelsea, if I, it's, it's okay to sure. speak, was, was, um, was, you know, sometimes when you're in a therapy session, the person's talking a lot, it's really great just to hear them out and say, I hear you, I hear you. And sometimes it's really great to just not hear them out and interject and intervene and say, you know what, you talk a lot, let's like focus on your feelings. So how do you decide, Dan, as a, as, as a therapist, when you interject like that and how much you push somebody or how much you just kind of stand back and play the mm. observer role? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, you know, when a person calls to come to therapy, they have become aware that something doesn't feel quite right, right? So I think one question just for all of us to keep in mind is that Sometimes there may be things that aren't quite right that need therapy, but you're not calling. Mm -hmm. And that we should actually come back and address that. But in Chelsea's case, you, you asked 
right? That's something yeah. to come in. I think for, we'll get to the answer to that question. Right. I think for, for my, my, my personal experience was that I was at my level, my anger was at an unmanageable level. I was so pissed about Donald Trump being elected. And then, you know, I was just, I couldn't get out of this tailspin of anger. And people were like, get away. They'd see me coming. They're like, get away. So I was like, oh, like I have to fix this problem. But, you know, therapy, I've danced around the topic for many, many years in my life. I had gone to therapists or, you know, psychiatrists before, but never with the, with the intention, I think, of fixing anything that ran deep. It was like, hey, I got a problem with patients or I've got a problem with this guy. What can you do? It was kind of incremental. I wasn't really ready to get real. So with Dan, you know, when I first went to him, I danced around a lot of the subjects in the beginning because I wasn't ready to talk about them. I'd had no vulnerability. Like, I could not access that. I could not let anybody see me cry. You know, if he even went there, I'd be like, oh, there's a reindeer out the window. Like, anything to deflect. And it wasn't even Christmas. To distract. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't fall for that, huh? <laughs> um, and, you know, so there was a lot of that. And obviously, he is a professional trained in that. So he understood what I was doing. But I was thinking I was being really clever and smart and making sure that he was smarter than I was before, you know, I gave him the account, <laughs> my type of <laughs> attitude, which is so arrogant and so, like, I'm not sure I need this. And of course you do, you know, of course. And you don't know what your anger's about until you pay somebody to explain it to you most <laughs> of the time. <laughs> So it's a great transaction. It's like, here, what's wrong with me? <laughs> and then you get that information and you realize, oh, I can make changes and I can mm. cultivate the empathy that I'm lacking or I could be less selfish or self-absorbed and I can actually contribute more. And when someone, you know, after the trust is built, you're willing to take everything they say and, and, and employ it. You're like, okay, I can do that. I'm gonna try and do that. I'll do that, I'll do that, you know? So. Uh, you have to be open-minded, and you can't go into therapy thinking, I'm going to tell them everything about, you know, I'll tell them this, this, and this, but not about Saturday. You have to go in <laughs> and make sure they see all of your ugly. Yeah. And that's really painful to do. So in the idea that's really painful to do, when you came for therapy, you know, um, the... The, f the framework the therapist has in her or his or their mind will shape what unfolds. That's what the research really shows. So you're asking the question, Soren, how would a therapist know whether to intervene if someone's talking a lot or not talking or you know whatever? So it really depends on the framework of the therapist is the first way of responding to your question. You know, the framework I work in uh, comes from a field called interpersonal neurobiology, which is deeply, deeply uh, embedded in science um, and looks at uh, basically the human mind in a very particular way. So when Chelsea comes in, you're walking in with your body and your mind, and, and your mind is going to have certain things going on that, from the framework I work in, will either fall into the idea of rigidity, like you know, being very self-preoccupied or being, you know, really tight and not really fluid with your own experience of your emotions or memories or thoughts, or chaotic. Mm -hmm. And chaos or rigidity would be a sign that there's something not what we call integrated um, that's in a state of more fluidity, that's flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable. There's a whole framework. So, so when you come in and, let's say, you start talking about the president. At, um, yeah, I would come in for the first few sessions just bitching about Ivanka Trump and Donald Trump <laughs> and, uh, you know, whomever was in the administration uh -huh. at the yeah. time. Like, I was really talking to him, paying him to talk about that. Right, <laughs> and so I, I could get that from the newspaper, but... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it, it, so it's, it's a living. It's a living. <laughs> it's a living. <laughs> so at some point, it's like what you're saying, Sword. <laughs> So at some point, yeah. you know, you've probably noticed, Chelsea is incredibly smart and super, super um, verbal. So just from a, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so from the framework I work in, interpersonal neurobiology, you know, we take what's called a mindset approach, which is to say that at that moment, a lot of Chelsea's left hemisphere, which is built in language, 
is busy, 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 busy with a lot of energy and information coming out through her language circuits in the relationship we're creating. Mm -hmm. And so then the feeling in my body is I get very left-brained and I can go left-brained about politics and stuff like that. And I have to be very careful because mm -hmm. I'm interested in politics and you're great at knowing about politics and we could mm -hmm. go off on that. But I have to know that the rigidity of that process mm -hmm. is a sign something's not integrated. So in this sense of just being really literal about it, at that moment, what I want to do is politely but firmly, you probably remember when this first happened. Stop talking. Stop talking. <laughs> And that's what I said to you. A lot, a lot. Stop talking because I would talk about something that was emotional, like my brother passing away, if it even skirted around that issue or something with my childhood. If I got emotional, I, I, he'd be like, stop right now and sit with that. And I'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was fighting my, was such, such resistance to being open and honest, such resistance to letting anyone see me be weak. Mm -hmm. You're like, yeah. oh my God, what kind of damage have I done here? Yeah. So, so that moment, you know, by, I hope I did it in a nice way, but firmly saying, please stop talking. I probably didn't say please. You know, just <laughs> stop talking. You know, I'm asking your left, I didn't say this to you, but I'm asking your left hemisphere to pause. And I want to accept your left hemisphere for its incredible gifts and then invite your right hemisphere, which is more closely related to autobiographical memory and more closely related to your body. So your heart, your intestines, your muscles, all of your bodily sensations come up what's called interoception up through uh, all sorts of areas. You don't, sorry, you don't need to know what those are, but they come up ultimately to the right hemisphere where you can feel mm. what's going on, not talk about it, mm. right? So this becomes really, really important. So after a few sessions, I get a, a gist of what's going on. I want you to feel really accepted for your politics, your interests, your whatever, all that's going on in a neutral way, so I don't go off on the politics too, but I'm really neutral listening. But then at the moment I decide to do, this is your question, an intervention, I'm saying, okay, I got the talk, please stop, or stop talking, and what I'm now gonna do is let you start having a very well-developed part of your brain that's keeping you from feeling mm. be invited into the room. Mm. Mm. Now, you could call that a younger part of you, you could call it a more vulnerable part. In, in our world, we would just call it the right hemisphere, you know, which is connected to autobiographical memory and to body sensations that are independent of intellectual ideas, right? So, if you think about that, when you look at the, the, the neuroscience of the social brain, it's our relationship, yours and mine, that now, and this is probably why you call this friends, changes me too mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there's a closeness that that I can speak for myself that I feel toward you you know that is not just coming out of nowhere it's like we are really going to go on a journey together because it's going to be my right hemisphere mm -hmm. and all of my autobiographical memory that I don't let flood into the experience but it's going to be activated it's going to be my body as we're resonating together and so I'm going to feel stuff that I can't even put words to mm -hmm. but it's that place without knowing the story of your brother, you know, it's that place that allows us to just stay with a feeling in consciousness mm. without letting the words distract both of us. Mm -hmm. So both of us can now be in a place that's not controlled, it's not trying to rationalize away a feeling of vulnerability and pain. As the therapist, I don't know what that is, mm -hmm. but I know we have to go there but I don't know exactly where there is, so I have to brace, embrace uncertainty, but know that, you know, because of the work I've done with myself and, and my own mindfulness practice and compassion practice, all that stuff, that I can have a wide, what I call a window of tolerance to be ready for whatever, because mm -hmm. I don't know what the whatever is. Mm -hmm. And it's and helped me widen my window of tolerance, because before it was this, or like, it wasn't anything. I couldn't tolerate people if they annoyed me or... <laughs> <laughs> you made a good living out of that. I um, know, that was believe me, night. and so I was getting rewarded for that behavior, <laughs> so I was like, well, this is how it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah. But no, you like, it, it, when you, somebody practices tolerance and patience with you, you're able to see what that looks like in an extended period of time, and you're like, oh, that's what I'm missing. Mm -hmm. So it's a good example when somebody's missing something to just show them, yeah. you know, I think, in that, in that situation. Yeah. 
And we went, we went on a journey because, you know, and I don't know, we could probably tell the story of the oranges, you know. Um, oh yeah, well that's body mind. You know, he, one yeah. day he came in and um, handed me an orange. We had, I'd seen him for a couple of months, had been seeing him for a couple of months, and he had handed, he picked an, he said, hey, I picked this off my tree, my orange tree at home. It's an, you know, I thought you might like an orange. And in my last book, which was about all this relationship and how it tra ch changed me, I <clears throat> told the story and it was, you know, my body, when he handed me that orange, something happened to me because I had known about the mind body being, you know, the mind, the body's like sending 90% of its, you know, messages to your brain. That's where your brain's getting most of its information. I'd heard about that, but I'm like, I don't know if that's true. And then all of a sudden I remember reacting to the orange in a way, cause it was like, it required me to be vulnerable, to accept something nice from a man. When I had been disappointed by two, you know, the two most important men in my life for things that were completely out of my control. But that, you know, I took with that, I don't trust men, I'm independent, I'm fierce, I'm reliable, nobody will ever make me vulnerable again. And so in that moment when he handed me that orange, my, my body was like, ugh, does he expect me to eat this orange now for him? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was repulsed. And I was like, uh, what is wrong with you? Tone it down. Like, by that point, I knew my behavior was off. And I was like, you're really angry. And then I was like, I'll be mad at him because it's the color orange. And he knows how I feel about that color since the election. <laughs> <laughs> Tricky color, but I, but I took that orange back. But in that moment, you know, I became undone. I was able to sit for the first time and cry in front of him, which was horrifying to me. And I, I couldn't get away from it though. And because of that, I had to like give it up. I had to give up my defenses and go, oh, you can't behave like this. You can't, someone's doing something nice for you in this minute and you can't even be present for it and say, thanks for thinking of me. You know, yeah. I love oranges, or at least I used to. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, that, that morning, because I knew we were having a session, you know, instead of going from the house to out in the front of the car, I went to the backyard to get that orange for you. You know, it was a feeling I had. But it, mm. so that's, that's another example of... of, of and now, of, I mean, this orange, sorry to interrupt, but now this orange has taken on a meaning. Like I have this Facebook group called The Orange Room, which is a grief kind of... <laughs> I'm serious. It's a uh. grief, like a uh, counseling room, not counseling room, but it's people who've lost someone. There's like 8,000 members and they're all supportive. And I go on there once, once in a while. And now my, my symbol is an orange for my brother who passed away or my mother uh. who passed away when there's an orange somewhere where it's not supposed to be like that's my mom saying hi or my brother saying hey and I was skiing last weekend in Whistler Canada for a week and I skied down a hill and there was an orange just in the middle of the snow oh. and I was like hey mom and I went over <laughs> and grabbed it there you go yeah so it's been so. taken on now I love oranges so <laughs> beautiful so if we unpeel the orange a little bit um <laughs> I mean, it's almost like you have this stuff written already, Dan. Did you write material? <laughs> it's a teleprompter. <laughs> <laughs> so if we unpeel a little bit, you know, first of all, for the therapists in the room, you know, sometimes you just have a feeling and you don't know where it's going to take you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's like a rule of three. So if it comes up three times, you really you can follow it. So I got the orange and gave it to you. Okay, fine. So now you're crying really with a huge amount of pain. And instead of having you analyze and say, what's, what's the crying about? I just am there with you. Mm. I'm being with you and just being present with the pain. We don't have to let the tears be wiped away or anything that we're there with that. And if I remember accurately, you know, um, and I, I know you don't want me to say this, but can we talk about Chet? Can we talk about your yeah. brother? Yeah. And by the way, we've already agreed I can talk about anything. Everybody's about, got it, so, Dan. Yeah, okay, no. <laughs> but the therapist, no. Why is he talking about that? He should have asked permission. Anyway, I had to do that, Chelsea. Okay, so, so at that moment, you bring up your brother, you know, and just to give the frame around it, because this could be a whole long unpeeling, but the short version of this is the, the, the real, the, the huge question becomes in that moment for, from the therapist's side is like, it's a beautiful story. It's really, um, you know, what's the meaning 
of what happened all those years ago. You know, what's the meaning of that? You know, it's now 36 years ago, right? Almost. And um, what was the meaning of that for you as a nine-year-old girl that, that he died? And so what, what began at that moment was, was a, a trip together, a, an exploration together, that you didn't know where it was going to go, I didn't know where it was going to go, but that I could be present for you, I could tune into where you were, I could really be there with whatever feelings were there, that there was a shared feeling of trust, and that as we went down to see what the whole constellation of your family was, what your, this is your older brother, what Chet meant to you as a nine-year-old girl, what he meant to you those, all the years of your life as basically an attachment figure, you know, to understand what attachment figures are in our own development and then to sit with the pain of his sudden loss, it was an accident on a mountain, and all that happened before that when you begged him not to, not to leave, but he went on the trip, and all those things that, you know, that moment in the therapy was so filled with openness and vulnerability and pain and, um, you know, that just to talk about it were things that maybe you can say something about what the prior years of your life had been like, not, not um, I mean, you were aware that he died, but not going deeply into the pain of his loss and also how your family was so grief-stricken after his loss. Yeah, I think that, you know, I, I, I mean, it was helpful to have it explained to me that you go into survival mode in those moments that you create whatever you have to create to keep your sanity and to keep yourself safe and, and going. So once, you know, that then, you know, to be unactualized, to not know that, oh, a lot of my anger stems from being mad at my brother for dying rather than admitting that I was in pain about it. You go into the mode, you're like, well, I remember going to school after third grade and people would be like, sorry about your brother. He had died over the summer. And I'd be like, it's fine. We're fine. Like, we're, we're done with that. <laughs> like, that was it because I saw my family kind of, my father specifically fall apart, my mom. And I was like, I'm not falling. Like, this is crazy. This is, I have to find my, I have to find like a safe place. And these people aren't it. Um, so to be, to understand that you can get stuck at certain ages and that like, you know, my relationship with men was totally affected by the fact that I was in many ways acting like a nine year old little girl in adult relationships. It's hard to date a nine year old for most people. <laughs> um, so. It was, it was just so helpful because I also think the, most, the, the, the best thing about therapy, about being open-minded, about saying, I'm going to do stuff that makes me feel uncomfortable. I'm going to go to a session when I really don't want to go sit in someone's office and cry for an hour. I'm going to go anyway, you know, and, and you force yourself to do the things that are difficult. All of a sudden, everything starts to open up to you in different ways, and you become open-minded to meditation, and you become open-minded to things that you used to judge, and you understand what this kind of um, community is all about, and instead of making fun of it, you join it, and you're like, okay, yeah, this is where the action is, you know? Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and... Did that sharing of it feel like it, it completed something in that acknowledgement of just all the different parts and that part of you that's still that age and the telling of Dan, did that, did that feel like something was healed in that moment? Yeah, there was a lot, of, a lot of the stuff, for those of you who saw the panels today, a lot of these topics overlap and, and you know, they go together. You start to realize there's parts of you, you know, even parts of me that, well, the, the ugliness of me, the jealousy I had towards other people. Where was that coming from and why? I didn't want to be that way. Why was I being that way? And the defenses that you build and the protective shield you build around to try and tear all of that down so that you can be cooler, <laughs> you know, and be like a real human being, it just all kind of, it all just goes together, obviously, you know, and then you start to realize the impact you're having on other people by 
getting your shit together. It, it, like, it has an impact on everything. And, and you understand that energy is a real thing. And wh why would you ever want to be a bitch? Because that energy is so corrosive, mm -hmm. you know? And I used to do that flippantly. Like, it was no big deal. Like, oh, I mean, I had a bad attitude, you know? And it needed an adjustment. So when you get a little glimmer that Ed Edra said this earlier, like, you know, you see a little bit of what's on the other side. You're like, oh, I'd like to go over there for good. <laughs> And um, Dan, how do you see your role in terms of, we were talking backstage, like you kind of have to accept somebody for who they are so they'll change. <laughs> so well, even if you think you yeah. know that somebody needs to work on something, if you tell them they need to work on something, how do you, how do you balance that art yeah. of support without push? So yeah, this sense of, um, you know, in therapy there's, you know, two bodies are there, one body, another body, and then one person is now opening up to communicate with the other. You're communicating with me. And in that moment, my only task at that moment is to be there and accept exactly what you're experiencing. Now, some of that will be in words. Sometimes the words get in the way, so I need to say, please, you know, stop talking and let's get to just feeling. And in that moment, then I'm still accepting, right? So I'm still accepting as it is. Now, the amazing thing about the whole process of the mind is that if you can stay with the experience within consciousness, and in this case, it's our relational consciousness that's happening too. If I can be with you, Chelsea, at a moment, let's say we're talking about Chet dying and your father's reaction, um, and you get filled with all sorts of memories of that time. Uh, they're called implicit memories, but they feel like they're happening right now. That suggests there's something that's not resolved. There's something called unresolved grief, mm -hmm. right? So then as a therapist, my task is to accept that there's unresolved grief, but to know, from the framework we work in anyway, that it's a, it's a blocked integration is how we see either unresolved grief or unresolved trauma, like abuse, mm -hmm. for example. So in our view, integration is health. Every form of impairment to mental health is a blockage in integration. Either integration is differentiation and linkage. So I know this sounds abstract, but I just want to show you how it actually answers your question. So I'm still in acceptance mode, and it's not like I'm going to make your mind, Chelsea, do anything. What's going to happen is, just to put it in a capsule from a long, many decades, your strategy when your brother died, partly because of how your family fell apart afterwards, was there was no support for you to say, here's what I'm feeling. Here's what I'm going through. And someone to say to you, wow, tell us about your pain. Oh my God, and for a nine-year-old to say that would, would have been really great, but that didn't happen. So then what happens is this blocked integration is how you make meaning in life. So the meaning of the loss becomes unworked through, unintegrated, and instead there are, are you, as you're powerfully describing, there become these what are called defensive strategies, just ways of surviving that then take over. Someone says, oh, I'm sorry about your brother. Oh, no, I'm over it, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Or then all the ways, you know, we're not talking about all the details, but we went through like every year of your life since then, mm -hmm. you know, in the therapy. So we could see how this strategy of surviving a nine-year-old loss that was, uh, that was not processed well by the family. And as a nine-year-old, you did the best you could. But then the strategies of survival took over in a rigid way. Mm -hmm. So then what we could do is see this 30, at that time, 34-year history as a way these strategies of survival were locked in. Mm -hmm. So now my job isn't to change those strategies. My job is to be with you, accept where you're at. But as we do that, there's a natural push towards integration if the relational conditions can be set up mm -hmm. so that the strategies that are blocking integration from arising can be loosened up a little bit mm -hmm. so that, just to put it really simply, the pain could be between the two of us. It didn't have to be with you alone anymore. And so in sharing that pain, we become something that holds it. And that didn't happen when you were nine. Mm -hmm. 
but it can happen now, and it happened in the therapy. And in that process of being with and accepting how things are, then things change. So it's not like you accept mm -hmm. to make them change. It's you accept, accept, accept. Acceptance is the bedrock of it all. And liberate these efforts to allow you to survive and do the best you could, that then natural integration arises. What's natural integration? It's feeling meaning emerge. It's feeling a sense of peace. It's being mindful is basically integration. Being compassionate is integration. Being kind is integration. All these other things, like being hostile and you know, being nasty to people, those are non-integrative states. So in our view, the therapeutic process, the educational process, the parenting process, the political process, the planetary health process, all of that comes down to integration. And the beautiful thing, and I said this when you said you're gonna write this book, you know, is it's a gift to the world because you're showing people in this very real, pain-filled and sort of also funny way that you have this incredible art and genius of doing, you've shown the world that if you're with unresolved loss in this case, and you're stuck, you're gonna be spewing all sorts of painful things out of the world when you do the work it becomes this very different way of living. And as you're so powerfully saying, it starts af affecting everything. Mm -hmm. Because integration made visible is kindness, compassion, and love, right? So that's where mm -hmm. it's really, it's a relationship literally of love. You know, it's therapeutic love that is releasing integration, you know, through and through. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And Chelsea, did you worry about what you were going to come through out the other side? <laughs> like, what if you were no longer funny? Or what if you, like, <laughs> no longer had the same friends? Or what if you were no longer there cared about the same that. things? There's a right? little of like, like you If have, everything's, yeah. Yeah, definitely. There are people who are like, yeah, you feel that. You're like, oh, God, now that I'm like this and I want to be kind to everyone, where's the funny? <laughs> you know? But... There was a, definitely a period of, of time where I, if it had, it was, I felt like a different person. I didn't know how to incorporate all of the things I had learned into my old personality, into the parts of my old personality that I wanted to hang on to. I didn't want that to be replaced, um, uh, but I, I wanted to you know, amalgamate the two. And I, I felt like there was definitely like a six month period where I was, because I overcorrected, you know what I mean? Then I would stop, like I, for a while I stopped talking altogether. I was like, you know, I talk too much. I should just listen to everyone. And people would be like, are you gonna say anything to dinner? <laughs> and I'd be like, you know, I just kind of like, I wanted to be an observer instead of the person being observed. So I tried yeah. really hard to do that. And I'm like, that's not my personality. <laughs> I have to get back to my personality. So that's where the two worlds usually mer yeah. you know, merge. And I think I had a big awakening for me. So I think it would be different depending on what your, you know, Know, what your kind yeah. of awakening is. Um, for me, it was like, and I don't think I'm not going to have another one and another one, but I definitely feel like, oh, okay, I've begun the process of healing. Mm -hmm. I'm no longer in that space. I am a different person. Yeah. I show up in ways for myself that I never did before. So I know I'm on the right path. Yeah. You know, I feel solid. I feel grounded. I'm not on my phone 20 hours a day. You know, I'm not, I read books now instead of watch mm -hmm. TV. I'm present, you know, and that's obviously the gift. My friend said to him the other night, I did a stand-up show in Los Angeles and he came and my friend said how great it is that you gave her the gift of awareness. Wow. Like, isn't that what wow. everybody needs? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I know, um, how many people feel like they're still trying to heal some trauma from the past and they're doing their best and there's still work to do? Yeah, so you're, you're, uh, you've got good company, including myself. Um, I don't know why this question popped up, but is there something you've always wanted to ask the other but were afraid to ask? <laughs> or hesitant to ask, or... I don't have any Curious unanswered about. questions or unasked questions. <laughs> you, yeah. yeah, yeah, I would say the same. Thing. And for people, we're very obvi obviously we, you know, we are very direct with each other. You know, yeah, obviously. yeah, and, and so. yeah. And for people who are um, in uh, that role where they they have a client and they want to build trust with that client so that that opening can happen. What do you think can happen on, on both sides? And also, just to make a note, we're going to have questions. We probably won't be able to get all of them. But in a moment, if you do have a question for Dan or Chelsea, there'll be a, an option to ask the question. Um, so just know that that's coming shortly. Um, and just be kind and generous and, uh, and ask 
uh, ask your true question. Um, but is there ways that you've learned to, that build safety? Because it seems like when that's the core of what you're really trying to do or is part of what's going to happen, you're not going to open if you don't feel safe. If you don't feel safe, nothing's really going to happen, mm. going to move forward. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's more of a question for you because you're the one who has to build the safety. Mm -hmm. You know, where you have very different personalities, he, he is more serious than I am. <laughs> so I, you know, and he's very careful and wants yeah. to make sure everything's okay and appropriate and I don't have any boundaries. So that bores <laughs> me. I'm like, yes. He's like, are you comfortable? I'm like, just shut up, land the plane. Let's get this show on the road, you know? <laughs> And you know, and he's just, that's his personality. Yeah, yeah. So like, you have to be available for other people's personalities and yeah. then they should be available to read yours and know when that's going too far, you yeah. know? Yeah. And then you get to know each other better. So that's helpful and that takes time. But as far as creating yeah. a safe environment. Yeah, I think um, th there's so much to say about it. But the, the one thing I think to relate to your question, Soren, is, you know, when I meet someone, let's say for the first time for therapy, like when we, when we met in that context, you know, I see... Um, that the person's doing the best they can, mm. you know, and there's a mm. feeling of deep respect that however you are, whatever's going on, it's the best you can do at this moment, right? Mm -hmm. It's the best you can do. So from that place, it comes with a deep place of respect and caring, right? Mm -hmm. And in the caring is a feeling like, I will bring everything I got that I've spent my whole life working on to be present, you know, and you know, I'm, I'm an acronym addict, so I'm, I, that's another part of my personality that I don't really <laughs> like too much. But, you know, I always think about this part business. I'm present, I'm attuning, I'm literally, I'm going to track what's going on inside of you in ways, you know, that you may not be used to having someone do. Uh, I'm going to be changed by that called resonance. Mm -hmm. And then that's where the trust, the safety comes in. P-A-R-T, presence, attunement, resonance, and trust. Everyone write that down. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So, I mean, literally, you know, my, my left brain likes to make lists like that. Anyway, but whatever. <laughs> but, but in terms of the right side of me, the, it, it's really about jo joining. And mm -hmm. it's about there's Chelsea in the room, there's Dan in the room, and then there's Chelsea Dan. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a we that emerges. And so, the, so there's three people coming to therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. the therapist, the client, and the relationship of the therapist and the client. And, so as the therapist, to really honor those three processes, beings, whatever you want to call those three elements, um, you know, I think uh, then, it, then it's really opening up to this, to, to the realizing you can never be certain of things. You, you embrace the reality of uncertainty and also you embrace the reality of interconnection mm -hmm. so that, that while there seems to be two separate people here, the we is really where the relational verb-like unfolding of, of things come. And I, I, I experience it that way. So I feel like that's how sa a sense of safety is created um, within the process that, that goes on. Did you want to add anything to that, or did he cover that pretty well? I think he covered that. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's not really up to the patient to make it a safe place. Right. I mean, right. that's not what's on our mind. Right, right. You know, I'm just hoping when I get in there, he's dressed, and so am I. <laughs> so you did have some negative comments about my shoes. Well, and that was, I think, reasonable, but okay. we, won't <laughs> we don't need to get into it's that. It's the weirdest right thing. One day, uh, what's that? What'd you say? <laughs> Nothing. Go ahead. No, come on. Oh, oh, here. Oh, now you go. No, we want to, we're, we're here to witness you, Dan. Tell us about the pain, the pain of the shoe. No, it's so funny because one day I was tying my shoes and I said, Chelsea's probably going to hate these shoes. And I thought, well, what are you going to do? Are you going to take your, <laughs> your belief she's going to hate the shoes? You'll never know if you don't wear those shoes. Sure enough, I wear the shoes. <laughs> I walk in. The first thing you say is, those shoes have got to go. <laughs> and it was so funny. Sounds like your instincts were right. They were. <laughs> but I never would have known. So you, sometimes you have to test those boundaries. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. they're right. <laughs>